Now, my sermon isn't about this at all, but I just love, I love the, who Jesus was, his personality, that often isn't preached about today, and that, and that at least when his personality is preached, it's kind of, he's just made out to be like a pacifist and, and real soft-spoken and everything else. But when he's talking to these people at the very end, and again, I have, my sermon has nothing to do with this, but at the end, he just challenges these guys. He's saying, okay, these Pharisees, baptism, I'll tell you what you want to know. I'll tell you what authority I, I can do all this stuff from. You know, baptism of John, is that from heaven or is that just made up from men? You know, and they're like, well, we can't answer because he, you know, he stumped them. And he's like, well, I'm not going to tell you then by what authority I do these things. And people say, oh, but that would be rude. You know, I can't believe Jesus would say something like that. Why? I mean, they want to know something. Why wouldn't he just answer them? Because he dealt with people appropriately. He didn't just, you know, was just totally Mr. Pacifist all the time and, and didn't have um, a smart answer for people. But anyways, regardless of that, I want to focus in on this chapter. Look at verse number 15 of Mark 11. It says, And they, they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Now, we're going to spend, basically spend the entire sermon covering this story. In this event that happens because it's significant it's covered in Matthew Mark and Luke this event and there's actually another one that is that happened earlier in the book of John records in John chapter 2 and we're gonna get to that later but the reason why this is significant is because we don't see Jesus Christ do like behaving this way like any other time in the Bible I mean he's literally throwing tables over I mean he's he's upending them and he's really angry and, and, and he's showing it and he's, you know, the Bible says, and I think it's in one of the other accounts that were the, the, they thought of the scripture, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus Christ was very zealous. He cared about the house of God. I mean, he loved the house of God. He loved church. He loved being there, right? And, and he had a lot of respect for it. So when he saw the house of God being disrespected and things happening that shouldn't be happening in there, he reacted appropriately by flipping over the table. Now, this is, this is a significant event. So that's what I'm going to dedicate the entire sermon to this event and why Jesus got so angry and, and what he was actually angry about. Now, first, it, it, there's so much to this, to this chapter because after he did all of that, he threw them out. He threw out the, you know, overturned the, the tables, kicked everybody out. If you're buying, if you're selling, everybody out, right? He's getting them all out of here. And then it says in verse 17, and he taught. So now he's going to teach them and explain why did he just do all this stuff. And, and he says, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. Now I want to focus in, first of all, on that, that phrase, the house of prayer. Because that's what God's house is. It's, he's saying, look, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 56. We're going to see where this quote comes from. Isaiah chapter 56. Understanding what, what God's house is supposed to be will help you understand why Jesus got so upset. He's saying this is what it's, what it's supposed to be, a house of prayer. People are supposed to be able to come here and communicate with God and talk to God. And you've made it a den of thieves. Look at Isaiah 56, verse number 4. The Bible says, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls 
a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, and again, I mean, this is an everlasting name. We see everlasting life in the Old Testament. We don't see ever the possibility of anyone losing their salvation. He says, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Yeah. They can't remove that name, right? All, the Old Testament is not like, oh, no, they had to do a sacrifice in order to be cleansed from their sin. No, they didn't. Not for, not for their eternal salvation. Verse number six, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord. Now that word stranger there, that just means like a foreigner. That means someone who's not physically descended of Israel or of Abraham. It's just someone that's a stranger. This is someone that, that comes and joins themselves to the land. It says also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord. So people that come and, and they want to worship God, they come and join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my coven, covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Now I want to point out real quick that this chapter is real clear. We had someone come and visit our church one time who thought that the only people that were saved were literal, physical descendants of Israel. He says that, to, and, and of course, he thought that he was a, a physical descendant of Israel. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who believes that that doesn't believe that they're one of, you know, one of the physical descendants. But he had this, he had this whole, I mean, he was a white guy too. <laughs> Some white guy saying he's a physical, okay, okay, well, whatever. Well, he's, he, you know what though? He's just as much a physical descendant of Israel as I am or as, or as <laughs> anyone is here, you know, probably that be just because of the mixing and everything else that, that I don't see him having any more or any less than just about anyone else in this room. So um, anyways, it was kind of dumb because he was really just, just ignorant of the scripture. He's been taught this and, and he had a few places that he would try to reference and try to cite. But overall, the argument was really lacking. And um, what we see here in Isaiah 56, he says, look, God's house is a house of prayer unto all nations. This isn't exclusive just for the physical seed of Abraham or just for the physical seed of Israel. Right? This isn't just for the Jews because he's saying, look, a stranger, a foreigner, someone born in another land, not someone of the seed of Israel, if they come and they join themselves unto the Lord and they want to serve Him, great. He says, my house is a house of prayer for all people, all nations, not just the nation of Israel. No, it's for all nations. But what they had to do then was because they didn't really have the local churches the way that, that it's set up now, they would go to Israel. They would go to the temple or the tabernacle, however, depending on when they were living, to go and join themselves to become, you know, to serve the Lord. And um, that's just what they would do. But um, it, it even says in verse 8, the Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, say, oh yeah, that's talking about the outcasts of Israel. Yes, it is. Saith, yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. So besides even the outcasts, because what they'll try to say is, oh, these people that are the strangers coming from other lands, they were still descendants of Israel, but they had just moved away and now they're coming back, which would be the outcasts of Israel we see here. But he says even in verse number eight, he says, yet will I gather others to him. And this is the very reason why I don't believe in segregated churches. You know, there's churches today that are like, you have a black congregation and a Hispanic congregation and a Polish congregation or whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. You know, people like to segregate and say, you know, yeah, this is just a black church. I thought it's God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. Yeah. Because your race, your skin color, the pigmentation that you have, where you were born doesn't matter. And it's even Old Testament, New Testament, for in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free, male nor female. Look, if you're saved and you're, you know, you're a believer in Christ, church is for you. 
and, and no one should be excluded from that. That's why we don't exclude anyone based on race or anything like that. It's pretty ridiculous. But um, this is where we get this quote from. He's saying, look, my house should be called a house of prayer for all people. It's a place where you can go and, and, um, and you know, it's also interesting too because he mentions in this verse um, about the, the people that, that want to come. It says to keep my Sabbaths. Verse number six, also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my mount, holy mountain. So he's talking about people who, who are doing all of these things, right? These people that want to join themselves, they want to serve him, they love the name of the Lord, they're keeping the Sabbaths, you know, and they're trying to do what's right. Hey, that's what the house of God is for. It's for prayer, it's for serving God and, for, you know, and, and, and doing all the things that, that he listed off here. Well, when Jesus comes into the temple, you could go back if you'd like to, um, to Mark chapter 11. He sees people conducting business as far as what we would think of business today, selling things, right? Buying, so they, they've got tables set up and they're over there and they're just buying and selling. And, this is not what his, his father's house was set up to do. It's not set up to run a business out of. It's not set up for money to be changing hands and goods to be being sold. Now, uh, one other point, I forgot about this. I, I want to um, point out, I don't want to leave this out. For, there was plenty of evidence in Isaiah 56 for the house, you know, the, the church being for all people. But... Um, even in Galatians chapter 3, and, and I just, just one last point on, on God. Um, it's not just physical Israel that gets saved. It's not just one group of people. It's not just, you know, this elect that's only Israel. It's, it's everybody. Galatians chapter 3 explains this very well in verse number 6. The Bible says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So what they do is they, they confuse the scripture that, that would maybe somewhat indicate an importance or significance to being a son of Abraham or being a son of Jacob or Israel. And, and they think that it's talking about the physical lineage when it's not. He's talking about here that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So if you have faith, you are a child of Abraham. So the promises that Abraham was given are the same promises that apply to you if you are a child of faith, if you have faith in him, in, in Jesus Christ. Verse number eight says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So one, we see a blessing unto all nations, not just the nation of Israel. All nations are blessed. Why are all nations blessed? Because they all can get saved through Abraham's seed, which is Jesus Christ. And it says that God's going to justify the heathen. The heathen is not some lost seed of Israel. The heathen are the unbelieving, you know, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and all the people that were around about them. Those were the heathen. But they get justified through faith, just like anyone else. Um, and verse number nine says, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We have Abraham's blessings. And then verse 16, Galatians 3, 16 says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So those promises that were made to Abraham, it wasn't like, you know, they like to say, oh, you know, God gave Israel this land and it's their land forever. And that's why we need to support them because these Palestine, you know, Palestinians and all these other people, they're, they're encroaching and they're taking their land that God gave to them. And it's like, look, these promises that, that they think just last forever. One, he made covenants with them, which they broke. They did not keep God's covenant. So there's no reason to think that this is going to be um, something that just lasts forever when they don't keep up their end of the deal. But number two, the promises that were made that are everlasting, that do last even, that forever, that are eternal, were the promises made to Abraham's seed. Not to all of the children that, he, that were ever, you know, came after him. His seed singular, which was Christ, which is very easily explained there in Galatians chapter 3. But um, turn, if you would, to John chapter 2, because we're going to look at this other 
account of Jesus coming into the temple. So we saw in, in Mark 11 that um, you know, Jesus is rebuking him. He's teaching him, saying, look, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And this, this story that we have in John chapter 2, it's almost identical to the stories in the other Gospels, except it seems to have happened at a different time. All the other accounts, when you look at Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all happen after Jesus enters in, you know, right before his crucifixion, he enters in. They, it's, you know, commonly called Palm Sunday. People are throwing down their garments and, you know, he's coming in on the ass. It's his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then that event takes place in the temple, right? And that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say the same thing. But here we see John chapter 2. John chapter 2 is very, very early on. It's like right after his first meal. It's right after he turns water into wine at the wedding is when we see this event unfold. And it's got a few different details. Now, he does essentially the same thing of kicking out people who are buying and selling and everything else. But we actually see a, a, little bit more, um, a little bit more details about the people who are there and stuff like that. So we're going to probably spend the rest of the time focusing on this passage. John chapter 2, verse 14 says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, Make not my father's house in house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So he's basically doing the same thing. He comes into the temple and he sees these people buying and selling and he drives them out. Now, um, let's look at a, keep your finger in John chapter 2 because we're going to come back there. Turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 14. We're going to get a little bit of background for the story of Jesus casting people out of the temple because when we look at what they were doing, what were they actually doing there? They were buying and selling. What were they selling? It says here they're selling oxen and sheep and doves. Now, those are all animals that were used to be sacrificed in the Mosaic Law. All three of those things. The, the oxen, the sheep, the doves, those are all things that were used four sacrifices which were in place at the time of Jesus Christ. And um, look at Deuteronomy 14, verse number 22. The Bible says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. So here we're seeing, he's talking about the law of the tithe. Verse 23, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, the place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand." and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, for she or sheep, or for wine, or for strong, strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So what he's explaining here is saying, okay, when you bring in your tithe, I think it was typically the tithe was brought in like once a year because of the things they were tithing on. It was very agricultural and they had, um, you know, they're raising animals and stuff. So, okay, your animals are bred for the year and you brought in your harvest. So you're going to bring in your tithe, the tenth, the tenth of, of your increase unto God. Now, God chose one place to set his name there, right? And it's, it's moved around a couple times um, in the Old Testament. But let's just say like for Jerusalem, for example, where the temple was built. If people lived really far away, 
like the farthest away that you can live or whatever, in order to make that journey to present your tithe unto the Lord at the temple, as was commanded, what they were supposed to do, they were supposed to bring it. It's a far journey. So what he's explaining to him is saying, look, I know that it could be far and I don't expect you necessarily to have to drive, you know, especially if you've been really blessed, you've got a lot of stuff, to bring all of this stuff physically with you, you know, when you make this journey to Jerusalem or wherever. And um, so he says, what you can do is you can, you can turn it into money. The value of everything you've been blessed with, all of your oxen and sheep and, and your crops and whatever it is that you're going to tithe on, turn that into money. Then you could travel a lot lighter. You can make it here. And then when you get here, you can buy these things. You could, you know, whatever you sell, you could buy the oxen, the sheep, just, just buy all that stuff up. Spend all the money that you had that you're bringing for your tithe buy these animals and then you can do your sacrifice and then you can give your tithe and of course the the fatherless and the widows and the levites all partook of that tithe that tithe supported all of those people and they themselves got to participate in that too they got to eat of their tithe and everyone else and this is this was god's um, way of taking making sure people were taken care of with the tithe but he instituted this and, and allowed for this for people to do this so what we see that they were actually doing in the temple, the buying and the selling of oxen and sheep and doves, there was nothing wrong with that inherently. Mm -hmm. That alone was not a sin. It's not a sin to, to, to say, oh, well, they should have brought... No, he, they could have turned their, their, their tithe into money and then bought these things after they got there. That makes sense. The problem is where they were doing it. It's not what they were doing so much as where they were doing it. Now... It, it, and it is also important. Flip back, if you would, to John chapter 2. It's also important. I just wanted to show you that in Deuteronomy 14, that this is in God's law. He said they can do this. So just the fact that they're buying the, these animals at that time, or you know, when they're in Jerusalem, that's not a sin. That's not a problem at all. It's a fact that they're doing it in God's house. But it's, a, it's important to note the difference between the account in John chapter 2 that we're looking at here versus the accounts in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. Because many people will say, in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19, they all say that, um, you know, you've made it a den of thieves. That my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. That's what Jesus said unto them in those three accounts at that time he did that. And what people will say is that, oh, he kicked them out because they were stealing. They were stealing from the people. Like they were, char they were way overcharging them. They were gouging them. So they were stealing from them because that's why he said, you know, it's a den of thieves. But I don't think that that's the case. But, but just for argument's sake, I'll, I'll let that go for a minute. And because he says something different in John chapter 2. He says not to make his father's house a house of merchandise. He didn't say thieves. So in John chapter 2, he didn't call them thieves. He just says, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. Now, merchandise is simply things that are bought and sold. So if you want to say, oh, well, thieves is because he was charging them so much money. Fine. Okay. Well, then what about John chapter 2? Define the thieves however you want. It still doesn't make it okay to buy and sell merchandise in the house of God because Jesus Christ said, make not my father's house in house of merchandise. This is not the place to buy and sell. And this is exactly the reason why we don't sell anything in this church. And I don't believe any church should. I, a church is in sin. Jesus Christ got so mad that he was flipping tables over. And it says in John chapter 2, he made a scourge of small cords. What a scourge is? It's a whip. Jesus Christ said that he saw what was going on. He sat down and he took the time to make himself a whip. And then went back into the temple and started driving everyone out and throwing over. I mean, think about the scene he was creating, throwing over the tables. There's probably money going all over the place. There's animals, I mean, oxen and sheep. There. I mean, think about these animals are in the house of God. Ox, sheep, doves. And he's just saying, get out of here. And he's driving them all out. And it's it not only, notice that not only does it say that he drove out those that sold. In all of the accounts, all of them are clear. It's those that bought and sold. If it was just the people who sold that were the thieves and that that's who the problem was, 
then why did he why did he care to drive out those that were buying stuff mm -hmm. they would have been innocent they were the ones getting ripped off why would he care about driving them out because they were making his father's house a house of merchandise yeah. so whether you're selling or whether you're buying and and if you ever go to a church and they're selling something there and you'd be like, oh, I can't believe they're selling stuff. Don't, don't you go and participate and buy something off of their bookstore book or whatever. You go into that church and you buy something, you are participating. You are just as guilty as those that are selling. I don't care if you're thirsty and you want a coffee after church or whatever. If they're selling it in the church, you better not buy it. Because if Jesus was there, he would drive you out with them that are selling it. Now, my take on Jesus calling them thieves, because I don't think it was, just, it was because they were ripping them off with the price or anything like that. First, I think it's interesting to note that, as I just mentioned, he didn't just throw out them that sold. Even in those, you know, this, in the, uh, in the gospel events where he didn't say, um, not to make my father's house a house of merchandise, but he said, you've made it a den of thieves instead. He still sold out, he still drove out those that bought as well as those that sold. But um, if it's not referring to them like gouging and calling them thieves, then who are they stealing from? Right? If they're thieves, if you're a thief, you're stealing. Well, I believe they were stealing from God, and here's why. It's because they were using the people that were coming into the house of God to make money off of them. Let's put, here's an example to, to help you understand what I'm trying to get across here with this, with this point. We actually had a litter of puppy want, puppies once when we lived in Gilbert, and we lived across the street from a real popular restaurant, right? And they had a lot of, a lot of people were going through that place. So, well, we've got some cute puppies we want to sell. We went over, like, by the parking lot and... and Hey, there's a lot of people. A lot of people are going to see this. They're coming to get a bite to eat. And they usually were coming with their families, kids to see the puppies. It's an opportunity for us to sell to these people because it's a great place where a lot of people were coming through. Well, the owners of the business didn't like that very much. Because in their opinion, they were, we were like kind of stealing their customers and we were, we were getting in front of their customers to, to sell something that they weren't selling at their place and they had a point you know I mean that is what we're doing we're trying to, to get in front of these people and and to sell them some puppies now I don't think it necessarily interfered with their business but that's that was their place so we didn't really you know they're saying it's not appropriate for you to be doing this in our, by, in our business and they didn't even want us like on the curb or whatever which was technically probably not their property but whatever um, but that's kind of what, what these people are doing when they're bringing this into the house of God. See, people are coming to the house of God thinking, I'm going to the house of prayer. I'm going to go get right with God. I'm going to go serve God. I'm going to do whatever. And now all of a sudden you come in and there's people selling stuff. Now, the stuff they're selling, it's legitimate for serving God, right? You could say, well, they want to do a sacrifice. So why can't they buy here? Well, because it's a house of prayer. Because now you're, you're just in God's house where they're supposed to be able to come and, and, and have a sanctuary and be, and be um, set apart for prayer unto God. And um, now you have people buying and selling. So how does this all apply to us today? Now, making God's house a house of merchandise, we can be seen in, in a couple ways. One, of course, I already say it was selling things. Like as a church, we're never going to be selling things. We're never going to be, um, you know, Oh, you want a Bible? Yeah, that's going to be a dollar. Oh, you want a DVD? That's going to be five dollars or whatever. Everything is free. We're not going to charge for any of it. That applies. We even had a... Um, I, I had a guy call me up once because he wanted to come through and set up his shop and set up a table. And, and um, he says they, they sold Bibles. Right? And they're nice Bibles. They're King James Bibles. They're good Bibles. I like them. They don't have any of the notes and stuff. But it's a church that makes these Bibles and they sell them. Okay? And it's not a separate business. 
It's actually a ministry of the church. It's part of the church. Now, look, we need Bibles, right? We spend money on Is there anything wrong with spending money on buying a Bible? No. But you buy it from a business. Yeah. You don't buy it from the church. You don't make the local church, God's house, a house of merchandise. We're not going to be doing this, this business transaction of selling things and buying things within the church. So it was kind of interesting because I told this guy, I said, well, you know, what exactly do you want to do? Because I don't let, if you haven't noticed, this entire time we've been around, it's only been a year, but no one has ever come up behind this pulpit other than um, Donnie Romero. And he's preached a sermon because I know him and I know what he believes and I know he's not just going to preach heresy in a church. And anyone I ever have to come and preach, I'm going to know enough about to know, you know that, that I can trust that what they say isn't just going to be total heresy or whatever. And a lot of times we'll have missionaries and other people want to come and do a presentation. And I'm like, no, we don't really do that to me. It's just, it's kind of a waste of time because again, what you're doing is you're trying to like sell. It's like you're selling a product. You're selling like, this is what we're going to go do. Now, there is a line, I, I, and I agree with that, that, you know, giving support to someone, like a missionary just to, to preach the gospel and stuff, there's totally biblical. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want to have this sales pitch for it either. I'll talk to the guy and we could, you know, I said, you want to come and visit us and you want to talk and stuff and, and get to know us as a church and talk to me before, after service, everything like that, that's fine. But we don't do the whole presentation thing. You know, I don't like doing that. But this group that was, that, this guy that contacted me that wanted to sell their Bibles, he says, well, we, we offer Bibles for like the mission field and stuff like that. We want to send the Bibles here, but we need support. And one of the ways they do that is by setting up a table and selling the books literally like in the back of service. So what was up? I'm like, we're not going to do that. Yeah. And he was kind of surprised when I, when I said that. And he's like, well, what? You know, like, wow. what? I was like, that is not biblical. And I told him, I said, you know, Jesus Christ said not to make his father's house a house of merchandise. Mm -hmm. And when you're setting up a table to sell books to the people in church, that's the house of merchandise. Yeah. And um, he didn't agree with me, but he was just kind of like stumped and shocked that like, and, and, and that's a shame yeah. because he's probably, he's talking to Baptist churches all over the place. I'm sure I've seen them in other Baptist churches before. I've even bought something from a, you know, a church way back a long time ago or after I got saved um, and didn't know any better from one of these churches that had the, all these books set up in the back. But um, it's too bad that, that more people can't make the stand of just saying, no, we're not going to be selling things in our church. The Bible says to uh, buy the truth. And so in Proverbs 23, 23, it says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. We're not supposed to be selling the truth. So if you have Bibles, what's the Bible? It is the truth, right? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the Word. You have the Word of God. As a church, we shouldn't be selling that. Also in Matthew 10, verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Okay? We're not going to, you know, we've received God's word. We're going to obviously preach the gospel for free. We're going to do everything in the service of the Lord for free. But we're also going to give our resources away for free. And if we can't, if the church can't afford it, then we won't buy it. And if the church can afford it, we'll buy it. And we're going to give this stuff away for free because we're not going to make God's house the house of merchandise. Now, one other way that this applies to us today with the merchandise besides the church being involved with the actual sales. And I hope this never, I never want to hear about this. I mean, if it's happening, I guess I want to know that it's happening. But I hope I never hear about this in our church. But that's people coming in and promoting their personal business to other people at church. You're making merchandise of them and you're using the house of God to find your clients and your customers. And it's wickedness and it's sinful and you ought not to do it. Now, again, a lot of people may, get, may end up doing this because they don't really think about it. They, you know, they're, they're not necessarily intentionally just trying to do this, but be aware of it.
Because this is ser we, we saw how serious Jesus Christ was about them making the Father's house a house of merchandise. Don't go trying to promote your business and talk and everyone, hey, did you know, by the way, I'm a plumber. Hey, I can do this for you. And now look, if you're if you're if you offer your services for free to people in church or something, great. I mean that's there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're saying, you know, hey, just so you know, I'm you know I can do this and you're and you're and you're saying, Oh, I'll you know, I, I won't charge you that much. Or whatever. And and whatever the business is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you start going in and trying to find customers at church, that is not what church is for. It's the house of God. It's the house of prayer. That's why we're there. It has nothing to do with your personal gain and trying to make money off of people. So I hope that I never have to hear about this because what happens is sometimes people get involved in these, especially when they get involved in these businesses with the pyramid schemes and they're trying to sell stuff and it's like, well, you need to throw these parties and what you invite all your friends to these parties and then they feel guilty like they have to buy something because they like you and they want you to succeed and they don't want they can't even afford to buy this stuff but you invited them and whatever and that's a whole nother thing which I don't agree with those things anyways but if someone's doing that if you're doing that and that's your business fine whatever don't go trying to recruit the people at church to come to your parties than to go and, and buy all of this stuff because you're doing the exact same thing. And if you're in doubt about it, just don't do it. Just stay away. And one other point, you know, if you conduct business outside of church and um, you, you make an agreement or arrangement with somebody and someone does work for you and maybe you owe them money. Right, like maybe, maybe Brother Jerry comes out and he's going he's gonna to do some work for me just personally. And I was like, okay, well, I'll pay you this much. Or you go work on my rental house. You could do this. And then he comes and then we meet at church. We ought not to be exchanging even the money and just doing a business transaction saying, okay, here's that money you worked for me. There's any other place in the world to do that don't do it in church. You say, well, why not? It just seems so harmless. Yeah, it seems harmless, no. but look what Jesus did. I mean, you're conducting business, even if it's so small, even if you're not, you know, I'm not trying to get customers or anything, don't conduct your business in church. Step outside. Go some, you know, I mean, if you know each other enough to, to, to talk to, you know, to talk to one another and, and to do business together, you don't have to be conducting it in church. And it ought not to be, and that's wickedness. And, and hopefully that never creeps in here. But um, it is important. The, the one time, I mean, Jesus really didn't hold back on this. When Jesus is picking up a whip and, and, and literally whipping people and animals out and just saying, get out of here. You know, you're a den of thieves. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. It's serious. And we need to make sure we understand all aspects of that so that we're not guilty of any of it. And, um, you know, just, just keep that in mind. And um, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for um, giving us this house of prayer, dear Lord. Help us never to desecrate the, the house that we have to worship in, dear Lord, or that we would um, disrespect you by making it a house of merchandise instead of a house of prayer like it was, it's intended to be. God, help us all to, to show wisdom in this area and not to go around trying to, to find our customers um, among your people, but that we can just truly have a godly fellowship with them and treat them as brothers and sisters and not as clients, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.